Hello and welcome to Algorithms Live. Uh, this week we have an episode on pitcher pouring. So if you tuned in last week and you saw the uh, episode on solution bags, then this is a good one to continue that theme and that idea. Um, so the focus is on these pitcher pouring algorithms. Uh, it's kind of a weird algorithm Two, uh, we're, we're going to take this idea of solution bags and we're going to extend it to multiple data structures instead of having just um, one data structure that we're analyzing, we're trying to find a solution bag for. We're going to be able to show that you can, instead of having just one data structure, you have two and you can play with them in tandem. Uh, and so I'll give two example problems on that. And I'm going to code them both both today. So we'll live code them and uh, see if we can get them working. Um, and I'll just dive right into the problems because the best way to learn this technique is just see a few problems, see a few examples. So um, <clears throat> here's the first problem is this problem estimation. So if you saw on the blog, our blog, uh, I posted this problem. It was from uh, University of Chicago Invitational in 2012. Um, and the problem goes something like this. You have a sequence of numbers. So um, maybe a bit bigger here. Uh, so you'll have something like 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and 7. And what you'd like to do is you'd like to break them up into some contiguous regions and then um, pay a penalty for changing numbers in those regions to be one number only. So for example, I could change, th pick this region and this region. And let's say I made all of these five. And let's say I made all of these over here. Um, let's pick something like, five as well, maybe, no, uh, I'll pick four. Then the penalty is just the distance between that number and this new target number. So in this case, uh, the penalty is one, and then these are one, two, three, and three. And what we want to do here is minimize the sum of these costs. So uh, you can just sum these distances together, and we'd like to just minimize this sum. So um, formally, it's like you translate it into one array to the other array. They give you this formula. It's the absolute value of the difference between what's already in that array at that location and what you're changing it to. Um, you can't make too many of these regions, though. And the, I guess this should be a little bit obvious. So if you look at the problem, if the number of regions you could make was n, which is the number of numbers you're given, then you could just change everything to be that number. Uh, and everything would be cost 0. So that wouldn't be that interesting. So you're given a k. And so you can form at most k regions. So the number of regions is up to 25. Um, and the number of numbers that you're given in the input is up to 2,000. So this is quite a bit. Um, the numbers themselves, so when you get to AI, they're going to be somewhere in the range from negative uh, 10,000 to 10,000. So something like that. So it's we have a lot of bounds to deal with here, something to work through. Um, so the easiest way to work through this problem, I think, is just working backwards is actually a little bit easier here. Uh, so the first thing we could say is, well, doing something, if we knew for some interval what the cost was, the minimum cost for changing it to be some contiguous number for some interval. So if we had some objective function that just told you for some interval from i to j inclusive what the cost would be, then we could write a dynamic programming solution taking advantage of the fact that k is not very big. So the DP would look something like this. Your state would be um, what position I'm at and how, how much k I have left, like how many intervals I have left to form. 
And then I could just loop over the next interval location. So jump from where I currently am to the end of what J is for some cost. So the pretty standard dynamic programming, if I could just pre-compute uh, pre this cost to be the minimum cost possible um, to work through this interval. Uh, so that, that's a pretty easy DP to code if we can pre-compute this cost somehow efficiently. So our, the crux of the problem just comes down to how do we compute this cost efficiently for getting things to be where they want to be? <coughs> and the idea here is to use um, a data structure to do this efficiently. So what we'll, what we'll be doing, uh, we have to make one more observation. It says, what should this number be that, um, to minimize this cost? So if we pick, let's say, the smallest number in the range, so we pick fours, then the cost here would be zero, the cost here would be one, the cost here would be two, the, the cost uh, is three. That, that's much more than five, which was a little bit better. So uh, the important thing here to realize is if you had some range of numbers, so let's say you had 100 and then 200, let's say we had 50 and then 3, then these numbers are going to be less than some number, and these numbers are going to be greater than some number if I pick something like 75 as being the interval. So if I look at a number like 50, then uh, the penalty would be 25, and the penalty on this side would be... Uh, 72. And then the penalties on the right would be 25 and then 120, uh, one, yeah, 25. So if I move this down by one, what you'll notice is each of these go down by one and each of these go up by one, right? So my cost doesn't change when I go down or up by one. But the cost really starts increasing a lot more when there's an imbalance between the numbers. As soon as you go, drop below 50 here, we're going to start paying more cost. And as soon as you go above 100 here, we're going to start paying more cost. So a little more observation of that, we need to find something that distributes the numbers as evenly as possible, and that would be finding the median. So we'd like to find the median of some range. So the minimum cost would be pick the median and then figure out what the pre-computed uh, pre cost would be. So we have this problem um, I like to call, you can look up, it's called a floating median. And so it's a subproblem to this problem. And there are many ways to solve this. You can do things with uh, binary index trees. You can do things with balanced binary search trees. You can do things with all sorts of data structures. But I'm going to show you how to solve this with this pitcher pouring technique. And so that's what we're going to work out. So the first observation for doing one of these intervals and trying to find that minimum cost is I can just brute force what the start of the interval is and then run a sweep to the right, computing the median for each ending interval j. And then in n squared time, I would know what the median cost is for my data structure. Um, so that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm just going to pre-compute it. So now what I need to have is a data structure that allows me to maintain what the median is as I'm moving to the right. I need some data structure that can do that for me. So we come back to the idea of solution bags. We don't want to commit to what this data structure is yet. We want to think about what the data structure could look like. We could think about um, how the data structure should behave and then commit to a data structure. So in order to have a median, we need roughly half of, we need to keep track of half the elements that are below the median, and then half, roughly half the elements are above the median. And so if we have some way of maintaining what's above and below, we could somehow figure out what the midpoint is and then work from there. 
So that that's part of our analysis. So we're we're going to end up having a data structure for that. So then what I'll do is I'll actually make two solution bags. So one that maintains below and one that maintains above. And then what I could do is I'll go through and process each of these elements. So I'll come across one and move it over here. Then I'll take the next one, four. Well, I could move it over here and it would be above. And then I go down here, I could get a three. So, okay, I could put it over here. And then four, I could maybe put over here. And so I've got a kind of balance here. And I know that the largest element here on the left-hand side, if I ever have my largest element, that's going to be my median if I keep these balanced. So I'll, what I'll do is I need to define what balanced means. Uh, in this case, balanced, so it needs to be balanced. So I'll say that um, if the size of below, or the size of, I'll call this lower and higher, that might be better. I'll call it lower and upper. So if the um, cardinality of lower, um, is equal to cardinality of higher, it's balanced. And I'll allow lower, I'll say or lowers cardinality plus one is equal to higher. And so cardinality is just the size of this data structure. <coughs> so if I maintain one of those two properties, then I'll say it's balanced. And then I could just query the left data structure. Um, for median, the ties don't really matter. Technically, you'll hear something like if you have numbers like this, the median will be 3.5. But in terms of minimizing the cost, you could pick any, any of these medians, like anything that basically makes it as balanced as possible. Um, so in this case, I'm just going to choose the leftmost median, and that will be the median I choose. So I could figure out what the largest value is. So let's keep adding numbers. We could add eight. Well, we could put that on the right, but now you notice we have a problem in our data structure. It's no longer balanced. So we need to rebalance it. So we'll take a four, move it over here. We take the smallest number of upper and then move it to the left-hand side. So we need, uh, right now we found we need two things. So here's our list of needs. Lower, we need something to do with the max. Upper, we need some way of obtaining the minimum. These are two properties that we need to maintain. And the other property is, of course, this balancing factor. We need to be able to make sure the data structure is balanced. So I'll keep analyzing this case a little bit more. We, we get across the 9. We move over here. We get across the 10. Maybe, um, maybe I'll make these too small to see other behavior. So if I come across another one, well, maybe I add that over here. It's still balanced. It still has some other properties. We need to also maintain that all values in the left-hand side are less than or equal to all values on the right-hand side, or else it wouldn't be upper and lower. So that's another property we need to maintain. Um, then we throw another two here. Now we're not balanced. So we need to take this largest number and move it over to the right. So we need something. Uh, to handle that. So a few observations. Uh, as we're moving to the right, the big thing we notice is that most one value moves left or right. So the, if you look at the median, in terms of the values that we had, if we had them in sorted order, where the median is is only going to move at most one location in terms of those values. So that's something to keep in mind. So we don't have a lot of movement going on, and this is why this picture pouring algorithm um, will start to work. But our needs are we need to maintain the max or the min. And so there's good data structure for always knowing what the max and min are going to be, and that would be a heap or in implemented in your favorite programming language, the priority queue. 
So if you have some kind of heap data structure, some priority queue data structure, we'll be able to know the max and min very qu quickly. And then it's up to us to figure out how to balance the two halves. So we've moved away from our bag. We've narrowed it down based on our needs. So conceptually, the way I think of this algorithm is we have two pitchers, and this is why I call it pitcher pouring. So I have a pitcher over here and a pitcher over here. And I have values that are going into these pitchers. So one, two, three, maybe there's a five here, a four here, two here, three here. And you'll notice it's not, it's not balanced. This number is greater than the smallest thing in this pitcher. Like the numbers aren't balanced, um, but they're for the most part they're going to be balanced. Uh, let, let's make this eight and nine, something like that. Um, so the idea is to pour the max element out of this pitcher and move it over here, and pour the min element of this pitcher over and move it over here, depending on how we're going to move things into our pitchers. So we're going to have pitcher pouring algorithm um, back and forth to maintain the median at any moment. <clears throat> so that's the idea behind pitcher pouring. We're, we're just taking advantage of the fact that our answer position doesn't change too much in our sweep, so we can maintain a data structure that holds this uh, information. So let's go back to the problem. We don't need to know just the floating median, though. We need to know for every single interval range, what's the cost of changing everything in that interval range to be the median? So that's a little bit tougher. That's not just finding what the median is. We actually have to compute this cost information. Um, we can't keep like a running best answer so far because our median is going to be floating. It's going to be changing around as we're running the algorithm going back and forth. So we need to contain some extra information. So let's say I have a sequence like 1, 3, 2, 100, 5, and then 9. Well, if I'm doing pitcher pouring, so I'll do a pitcher on the left. That's my uh, cue, and I'll do a pitcher on the right. And the way, the way I'll implement this is I'll put the number on the left one and then rebalance it as needed. So try pouring the left one into the right, try pouring the right one into the left, and try to get this balancing factor. So I come across a three. I'm just going to always add it to the left-hand side and then pour it over to the right. What I'll do at the top here is I'll just keep track of my median. So this is the value. This is my median, the top. Um, so the median here is 1. I pour this over. This is also 1. I slide things over. I put the 2 in. 2 is now my median. It's the max thing in the left queue. I move over. I put 100 here. So I try pouring the 100 over to the right-hand side. It's the largest number. And then uh, everything is good. So this is also 2. I get another 5 in here. So I take the five, put it in the left-hand side, pour it to the right. And then I have to pour this three back to the left. So three ends up pouring in to the left-hand pitcher. And so now three is going to be my median. Try throwing nine in, pour the nine over. Nothing has to change because I've maintained this property too. So we want to maintain each of those properties. So we are maintaining invariance, just like we were doing in uh, the solution bags lecture. We were um, maintaining an invariant on our data structure. So that's what we want to do here. But the problem is we need to know what these costs are at any given moment. <clears throat> so here's one way we're going to do that. I'm going to maintain some extra information on top of my solution bag in order to compute the cost. Um, so I make the observation that my cost of everything in the right pitcher is going down because it has to go down to go into the floating median. And then everything in the left picture is less than or equal to the floating median. 
So everything in the left pitcher is less than or equal to the median. Everything in the right pitcher is greater than or equal to the median. So if we knew the sums of the left pitcher and we knew the sum of the right pitcher, we could very easily know what the cost is for obtaining that median. We also need to know the size of the pitcher. So I'll give you an example here. Let's say this is six. And over here is 114. If we have just those pieces of information, we could compute the cost. And so here's how this works conceptually. Here's one, here's two, here's three. This is our median. Well, our penalty is going to be right here geometrically, if I drew it as boxes. So in other words, if I pre-computed what the size of this box is, you'll notice that this dimension here is the number of elements. and this dimension right here is the cost, then if I just subtract out the sum of all the elements that are in my box, what I'll be left with is the cost I need to pay to change all these elements to be the median. Let's look at the right picture. So roughly speaking, there's 100 elements right here. So this is, could be really high, I'm not drawing it to scale. Um, then there could be five elements right here, maybe, and uh, nine elements right here. And we need to get down to three. So again, not to scale. Um, so the cost of paying this would be removing all these sums. Right? So what we need to do is we need to subtract out this piece from the sum total because the entire total would be all the way down to this bottom. And so if we just subtract out this blue region from the total sum cost, then what's left is the penalty I need to pay to move these things down to the median. So again, this is the number of elements in my right pitcher. And this piece right here is the cost of the median. So I, I really should say uh, median. And this is also the median. Moving it up to the median. So for each of those dimensions. So that's how I'll pre-compute my cost. I'll use floating median as I go to pre-compute what the floating median is. And then also maintain for my pitchers, what's the sum of all the elements in my left pitcher? What's the sum of all the elements in my right pitcher? And those two pieces of information combined are going to be able to tell me what the cost is for any given interval, which will be really helpful. So let's go. I actually want to just code this one now. Um, so I'll show you how to implement this. This is a pretty cool algorithm, uh, algorithmic problem. And uh, yeah, I'll just show you how you code a pitcher pouring algorithm um, for this estimation problem. All right. So as you can see, I'm just reading in the input. I'm reading in this value k. There's nothing extra special going on here. And then for my priority q, I'm going to have two priority queues. This is the lower pitcher in terms of doing pitcher pouring. And what I'm going to do is I want a maximizing priority queue. So in Java, there's this thing called collections.reverse order. Um, what it is is a comparator that makes that does its comparisons opposite of the natural ordering. So it's great for this use. Um, and then priority queue also, I could make a version that's just normal, and this is the upper. Um, and this just comes down to that whole thing in terms of my solution bag. I need I need something that's maximizing and something that's minimizing. Um, so I always want to know what's the maximum element in my lower picture and what's the 
minimum element in my upper picture in terms of moving them around. OK, so now I need to make a cost matrix. So for every single ij interval inclusive, what I'm going to compute is just for that range, what's the minimum cost for making everything that height? So I'll brute force the start of the interval. Um, and here I'll just clear my queues because uh, I'm going to be running this multiple times. So I'll just clear my two priority queues. And I'll also start keeping track of the sums. So I need to know the sum of my left picture and the sum of my right picture. So we'll call this upper. But now I'll look at the right side. All right. So what I'm going to do conceptually is just every time I come across an element, I'm just going to throw it into the left picture. Um, even if it ha has an element, even if it doesn't have an element, it'll just make my algorithm a little bit simpler to code. Um, there might be another easier way to do this, but this is the way I always like to think about it. Uh, it tends to work well for me. So I'm just going to conceptually move it to the left picture, or literally move it to the left picture. Uh, <laughs> And now what happens is I need to maintain my invariant. So my invariant is the lower picture must, everything in that must be less than or equal to my upper picture. Um, a second invariant is the size of the lower picture only can be one off from the upper picture. Um, and if I maintain those properties, um, then I'm good to go. So I have to work on maintaining those properties. So by adding an element to my lower picture, what could have changed? Well. I could have had a problem with the size invariant. I could have made lower too big. Remember, it ha if it ends up being um, greater than one of the upper size, then I have a problem with my invariant. Or I put it in the left picture, and the biggest thing in the left picture doesn't, um, the thing I just put in the left picture is really huge and actually needs to go on the right side of the picture. So now I try moving things over. So those are my two properties. So the first one is size. If I'm not meeting the size invariant, then I know I need to move things over. Uh, the second one, um, I need to see if the lower is greater than, um, if the biggest thing in the left picture is greater than the uh, smallest thing in the right picture, then I'd have to move something from the left picture to the right picture. I'm checking the size of upper making sure it has at least one element. I don't have to check the size of lower. It's always going to have at least one element because I'm maintaining these invariants. So I don't even have to do that check. Um, the reason I have to check it on upper is it could be zero, and I don't want to get a runtime error on this call to peak, trying to pull this out of my um, priority queue. <clears throat> And short circuiting in Java, if you have and, if it does the first operation, it won't do the second operation if it fails. So um, good to know. Makes it a lot easier to code this stuff. So we'll pull the thing on the lower queue, and we move it to upper. At the same time, we also have to update our two sums. We have two sum information that needs to be updated. So I, we need to put that together right here. So I'll do sum lower, and then I'll just add this new value. And then sum higher, sum upper. Oh, wait. Lower, lower lost its value, right? Lower lost its value. Upper gained its value. So I move things left to right. Um, then I try pouring things back the other way. The only bad thing that could have happened here um, in terms of pouring back is I could have made upper too big by doing the pouring. So this value I just added might have been too big for my own good. Uh, so now what I'll do is just check if the upper value is less than the lower value. I'll just move it from the upper queue and then move it into the lower queue. Then once again, I'll just update my sums. 
So I'm gaining something in the lower queue. So maintain that aggregate information and then do the same for the upper queue. Move the upper queue. So you might be wondering, how do I know that's sufficient? Um, you can actually just do all the case work. Just work out there's about four cases. Um, so you work out those four cases and see this is sufficient. Um, it might be over overly sufficient. Uh, there might be something I'm handling here that I don't need to handle, but I think I handle everything and I think I'm not doing any extra work here. Um, you'll notice that this update is at most log n because the calls, there are at most two calls to pull and two calls to add at any time and priority queues run in log n. So this entire pre-comp is going to be n squared log n, which is a pretty good runtime um, for figuring that out. OK. <clears throat> and now if I want my median in terms of my floating median, so I've been sliding in terms of my picture pouring, um, I can just pull the median out here, and it's always going to be lower dot peak. It's always going to be my median. So a good way to implement floating median. So what's the cost of the lower side? Um, well, I'll just take the number of things that were in lower and multiply them by the median and then subtract out how many things were lower than me. If I go back to my picture, all I'm doing here is I'm taking everything up to and including the median, and I make this box, so that ends up being the number of things that are in the queue lower, subtract out my median, or multiply by my median, and then subtract out this blue piece. And that's this line of code that I just wrote. And then if I want the cost of what's higher than me, so cost upper, then I'll just take some upper and then just subtract out that same box. So upper dot size times the median. How many things are above me? And again, what I'm doing is I'm taking some upper, which is these giant towers right here. There's three of them, one, two, three. And then I just subtract out this blue box. And what I'm left with is the price of making those the median, which is pretty cool. I found my floating median. And so now I need to update what the cost is for i and j. So my cost i, j is as follows. i, j is cost lower plus cost upper. Now I can write my dp. So I've pre-computed all of the information. Let's write the dp. Uh, I'm going to write an infinity value in here because that will be useful for my dp. Um, so I'll make it a one-dimensional DP. Uh, so I'll do this space saving style. So what the DP is going to hold is um, for a given I after K moves, what is the um, minimum I have to pay to get out to that position I? <laughs> no. So being at position zero costs me nothing. That's my base case. Uh, and then I just try updating this for a number of iterations. So I'll just go through all the different k values. I'm going to run this step k times. And then I'm going to loop through in reverse order. I don't want to jump twice in a single k iteration. That's why I'll go in reverse order. Then I'll loop through the next location. So I have to consider going to all next locations j. And so jump, what I'm doing is I'm jumping to position j plus 1. So the way I'm thinking about this is I have an ij interval inclusive that I'm going to make a single median value using the cost from the cost table we pre-computed. So that's what I'll do here, min of dp j plus 1. So I have um, my current position in the dp, which is i, moving out to j plus 1 for cost ij. That's the interval I'm forming. That's my DP. I just write a quick DP table. And uh, then I just output the nth thing. And there we go. And now I have the cost of knowing um, exactly making these k intervals, decomposing it into exactly k intervals. Um, some of the intervals could be the same cost 
So even if I use less intervals, this is still fine. And that's my DP. So let's see if we got that working. Uh, I'm just going to try compiling it. And uh-oh, I'm not feeling too confident about getting this first try because it didn't compile right away. So let's see if I have a bug. Ooh, definitely have a bug. So try to fix this bug real quick. Um, let's see. If you're trying to debug this, probably the easiest way is uh, printing out the two the two pieces. So I'll do that real quick. Lower. Or, We'll print out the I and J information too. Make sure things aren't sliding around too much. That piece appears to be working. Yeah, the you can see the medians are working, it seems. So uh, our invariants seem to be holding. Uh, nothing, nothing too bad there. Uh, maybe I'll print out some cost information. See if that's what's what's going on here. Because if the cost information isn't correct, um, then I have a serious problem. So cost upper, cost lower. That seems correct too. Oh, I never filled my array with infinity. Well, that'll do it. And that's the sample case for this problem. Uh, you get something out to cost nine. Um, so we will attempt to solve this problem. So I was coding this a little bit earlier. So I got my estimation. See if we uh, get these correct. Seems to be getting them correct. And we're accepted. Um, so that's how you solve estimation. That's our first problem for tonight. Um, let's work on the second one. So I've got kind of a neat problem. I hope you guys give this one a try in um, from the blog. And let's let's just start talking about it. So let's go back over here, change my setup. So okay. So this problem is really cool. It's from the uh, Tehran. So it's The Asian re regional, uh, so we, and this is from ICPC, but this is the Tehran site. And uh, this was in 20, 2015, this was their ICPC regional. So there's always takes place in December, it seems. Um, and the set, if you do the 2015 set of this, this set I recommend, it's really good. I am I was really happy with the problems. They were a lot of fun to solve. Um, and so we come across this problem, problem E from this set. It's called billboard.
And it's neat because it's a uh, also pitcher pouring. So the problem you're given, you're given some uh, billboard. And so ones are cells of the billboard that light up. Zeros are cells of the billboard that are out. So they'll, fr I think they frame it as diodes um, on the billboard. So they're either on or they're off. And so I'll, I'll just draw a billboard out here. So you'll, what you'll notice is pieces of the billboard light up and some pieces of the billboard um, are broken. And to get around the fact that part of the billboard is broken, what you're going to do is you're only going to put advertisement on a part of the billboard. And so what you'd like to know is you'd like to know what's the largest rectangular region you could light up correctly. Uh, that's a pretty classic, easy problem in and of itself. So maybe you just find the largest rectangle. There's one small caveat here that makes this problem a little bit tougher, is you're allowed to fix the billboard. And so what you're allowed to do to fix the billboard is change an entire row of the billboard to be all on, or change individual diodes. So the, the input gives you um, some number of row changes and some number of column changes. So maybe you have one row change and one column change. Um, so this is the cost, our number of times I'm allowed to fix a row, and the number of times I'm allowed to fix a column. <clears throat> and now, after doing these fix operations, I'd like to know what's the largest area I can have for the, the advertisement. Yeah. Largest area add. So that's that's what we'd like to compute. The pretty standard tricks to begin, um, but let, let's look at the bounds. Um, N and M are your rows and columns, and you'll never have more than 300 of those. Um, you may have a pretty large number of fixing operations. Uh, they say it's just a non-negative integer, uh, and that doesn't matter too much in terms of the solution. So we're going to do a fairly standard trick to start us out. We know that this is down to 300. What we're going to do is brute force the row and column of our ending rectangle. So if we know the width of the rectangle, this simplifies this problem to one dimension. Because if we brute force also the start of some rectangle, we could do some calculation information to know what the end of that rectangle is that's possible. So it's that given a start left, a start right, and a start top, What's the largest rectangle that I could form going down? So that's pretty crazy. So how to do this? This is a um, pretty tricky problem. So what we're, what we're going to do is that's going to be our cue for what we should fix. So if we knew what our rectangle was, we'd know exactly what to fix. So let's say this is our rectangle. Let's say we have one fixed row and one fixed column, then we'd want to take the row that has the most number of lights that are out, fix those, um, and basically find the rows that have the most number of lights that are out. And then the remaining lights that are out, we can fix, well, this isn't fixed column, it's fixed diode. So that was incorrect. Um, and then use the number of remaining rows to fix the diode. So in this case, I would choose this row I would pay a cost of three, but it, it's only doing a fixed row, so my cost is actually just one. And then I would just fix this diode right here. And then that is also cost one. So for um, with the moves that I have, I could actually get this rectangle of three by three um, and have a pretty big area. So that that's the solution idea. But how do we do that feasibly? So what we're going to do is we're going to do, a, similar to that last problem, we're going to do a two-pointer kind of sweep here. Um, so the first thing, we're just going to brute force row and column. And then uh, when sweeping down the columns, all we really care about, 
so getting rid of things, is how many lights are off or on that row. So um, in the first row, there are zero lights off. In the second row, there's three. In the third row, there's one. In the fourth row, there's zero. In the fifth row, there's zero. And now we can do a kind of two-pointer. So we could pick where our start is and move out right until we don't have enough resources to fix them. So greedily, what we want to do in terms of the fixing is we want to use the rows on the most expensive rows. So let's split our data structure going right back to picture pouring. So we're going to get two solution bags here. What we'll do is keep the most expensive items in the right picture and then anything else in the left. So right now we have zero and three. But if we look in this terms of the sample, the number of things we can fix in terms of rows is just one. So we'd like to keep our right picture to be no bigger than one thing. So if we slid to the right here, we'd have no more than one thing in this picture. So we need to move the cheapest items over to the left picture given time. So I'm going to start populating the right picture as I go and then move things to the left. In order to move things to the left, the left picture, its property, it must be able to obtain the minimum. All right. So I continue moving to the right. So I end up with a one, obtain the minimum, move it over to the left. I move one more over to the right. Let's say that there was something off here. Maybe there were two things off here. Well, now I can't do it. I only have one fix operation in the left picture, and I can only fix one row. So I move something to the left. It's impossible because this has to be size one, and I have too many things to fix over in the left pitch. Uh, the, 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 yeah, I'll call this upper. And I'll call this lower again. So I got my left and right backwards. I have too many things to fix over here. So on the left picture, we need to know the sum, the sum total of how many things are over here because they'll tell us if we have enough single diodes that we can replace to get the things in the left picture. Pretty, pretty tough there. Um, Right. OK, so when something is impossible, that's when we know to stop. We know that three was the biggest we could do. So then we want to do a sort of two-pointer sweep. We want to move our pointer to the right and then continue on and see if it's still possible. So to do that, we have to actually remove this element. But we don't know if it's in the left side or the right side in terms of our answer. Um, so what we need in terms of our data structure is a way of removing the value from both of these. It could be in the left or the right. So we need a way to remove arbitrary value. So that, that's kind of a problem. Um, and you'll notice that takes us away from using a priority queue because a priority queue can't do random removal very quickly. <clears throat> so that does limit our solution. Um, but that's the way our two-pointer is going to work. We're just going to move left to right with two pointers. We're going to keep maintain the first pointer on the left, move out to the second pointer on the right, and if we end up having a problem, then we can um, know to stop the two pointers. And the idea is uh, if we stop right here, then our solution is going to be less than or equal to what we currently have as our best area solution. Um, so we could only move right to improve it, or we'll stop right at this position. This will also be impossible. Um, so this two-pointer sweep will, sweep will work because I can only make this better by removing more things. So this is also not possible, so I'd move it down to this location. I'd remove the three. Then I would try pouring back the two, pouring it over to the right picture, and suddenly, again, this is now possible because I have one row fix that can fix this two and one diode fix that could fix this diode. So that's the idea with the pitcher pouring. 
Um, so now we have our pitchers. Now we know what the pitchers need to do. We need this one to also give us the max at any time. So this is a lot like the max and min pitcher pouring with the heaps. But we need to also do this remove arbitrary value. So in Java, we can use a tree set because the tree set can you can get the max, the min, um, or remove an arbitrary value. Uh, and C++, you could use multi-set. And it'll do exactly the same thing. Uh, it's a little bit more annoying in Java because you could have ties for the rows. So we're going to have to add some tie-breaking procedures um, to prevent tie-breaking. So I'm actually really jealous of people doing C++ because uh, multi-set basically allows you to have ties and not have to handle that specially. But if you are a Java coder, uh, we'll go over the uh, tie-breaking procedure for that. So that's roughly what we do. Um, we just maintain a tree set for the left, a tree set for the right, and then maintain this data structure in terms of pitch reporting. And then we're just going to brute force the left and right. We're going to do our two-pointer sweep for what remains. OK, so let's get coding. Pitcher pointing time. So I'll work out of a different directory. This is also problem Eve for that set. So uh, I've already got some of my input information here. Um, get rid of that. <clears throat> OK, so we need to read in our data. Um, but I'm not going to read it all the way in. What I need to do is I need to very quickly turn it into that 1D version of the problem. So if I go back over to this piece right here, I need to know, to, in order to turn it into the 1D version, I need to know for a single row, given this left and right boundary, what's the number of things that are off in this range? So instead of counting what's on in this range, I'm going to count what's off in this range. And I'm going to do that by maintaining a prefix sum of every single row at a given time. And then I can do the inclusion exclusion trick to find out how many things are in that row or in that range. So that's where I'm going to start. So I'm going to call this thing bad sum. So what I'll do is I'll actually do my prefix sum off by one. So cell zero is going to just always contain zero. And my column is just going to be offset by one the whole time. This makes it easier to avoid an index array out of bounds for a range starting at position 0. So it'll just make the special cases easier to code for my um, 2D range, which is something I really want to do. So I will read in the input and store these prefix tables. So I'll grab the input here. So the input tells me what nodes are on. I'm going to only care what nodes are off, so I'm just going to invert that. XOR would have worked as well, but that's how you invert a single bit. Um, so then bad sum ij plus 1. So I'm taking the previous sum up to and including j and storing the answer ending at j and j plus 1. So this is just prefix sum for every single row. OK, so now we do the algorithm for pitcher pouring. So we're going to look for our result. We're always able to have a square, a rectangle of size 0 that basically doesn't have any nodes on at all. Um, that's the largest we can have. And we're just going to replace that for our answer. So i and j will be the columns. I'll loop through column information. So m represents some column, or the column width. I'll do ij inclusive for some column area. And then using that, I could find um, where I'm going. <laughs> so now I need my data structure to store that pictures, those two pictures. So let, let's start coding that. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this thing balancer. So I'll, I'll code this first. And the idea is to maintain, uh, once your pitcher pouring gets complicated, what one thing I like to do is I like to make a separate class to do my data structure. 
Um, so what I'll do here is I'll have two functions. I'll have one called add. And so I'll basically add a row. And it's a number of dead pictures. Uh, and then I'll also tell it what row it's on because I need some tie-breaking information in terms of the value. I can't just store an int in a tree set, so I need to tie-break on that value. So I'll give it what row it currently is at. And then I'll also, I need a remove function. So I'll take the number of things that are dead and remove it from the structure. And so that, that would be that information. And then uh, another function that would be really helpful is having something called is stable. And then I'm going to pass in the number of spare diodes I have. So what I mean by is stable is it basically just tells me whether or not I have enough to repair the rectangle this balancer is currently representing. So I'll have some way of doing that. Um, I need to make another helper class because I'm in Java. So what I'll do is I'll make a um, something called ord int. And what this will do is it'll just save an int, but it'll have some tie-breaking procedures for um, ints. So I'll save what row I'm on. So I'll have the value and then some ID information. And so if I need to tie-break, I can just store the ID. And that's my ID. And I need to implement a compare to. This is Java. It's very verbose in Java. If the two values are equal, I compare them by the ID. Otherwise, I compare them by the value. Um, and I, I typically, you could do subtraction here to do the comparison, but I'm always afraid of integer overflow, and integer.compare just avoids that completely. So that's why I typically use it. OK, so designing this class. So what we need to do for our balancer is we need to contain information on the lower picture. Uh, we need to know the sum of things that are less than the median. All right, well, not median. Uh, the sum of the things that need to be fixed as single diodes. And then I also um, um, spare. Oh, right. So the spare rows are basically what I'm going to be replacing for rows. I need that information in order to figure out if it's stable. Um, but I also need this to know how big my upper can get. So my tree set for upper could get pretty big here. So that's why I need to keep that. Or uh, It needs to be balanced. That's one of the invariants on this data structure. Um, so I'm going to keep that as well. We get lower, we get upper, we get my balancer. Save all this information. OK, I have my lower and upper uh, in terms of my beta structure and all that information saved. Now for add. So what I'm doing here is I'm adding a row to my data structure. Um, so I need to do that picture pouring too. So uh, initially, what I'm going to do is just assume it's in the right side. Um, <laughs> and then I have a problem. So I need to maintain an invariant. Uh, the invariant is upper cannot be too big. It can't have too many rows. Um, so if it ends up having too many rows, I need to pour something out and put it into lower. 
The other thing that could happen is the thing I just put into upper is actually smaller than the largest thing in lower, in which case I need to pour them back and forth. So those are the two um, cases I, I was thinking about. So I'll do those here. Uh, one thing though, so before I was made sure that lower.size was greater than zero so I could compare upper and lower. Well, one thing that could happen is now upper could be size zero because I might have zero um, fixes. Uh, actually, I don't have to compare that because I just put something in upper. Never mind. <laughs> uh, that will save me a little bit of work. And so I just look to see if my invariant is maintained between my data structures. And now I try moving the largest thing of the left-hand side, or the upper side, right-hand side. So the smallest thing there, and I just add it to the lower. And I also have to maintain my sum on the lower because that's how I'm going to pre-compute information or compute information um, about balancing these two values. I also need to remove, be able to remove from my data structure um, from an arbitrary piece. So the way I do this, this is why I passed row information. Uh, the thing that I was killing might not, might not be dead right now. So uh, I need to try removing it. So I make a new one that has the exact same information passed through. And I try removing it from lower. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume it's in lower and try removing it. And then if it was in lower, then I need to update my sum information. And I'm done fixing things. I don't have to maintain any more invariant here because the, uh, the upper isn't changing at all. And lower doesn't have any extraneous uh, information that needs to be updated, just its sum. Um, so that's fine. So I don't have to do any rebalancing. The other case is it failed to be in that position. So it's definitely in upper. And if that's the case, then I need to potentially give upper an extra row. So if lower dot size is greater than zero, then I need to move something to upper. So I just take the, uh, the best thing in the lower side. The, the max value, so I'll do pull last. And then I update my sum. I remove that from upper. All right, so the last thing I need to know is, is this thing stable? In other words, if I'm currently at this position, I have all these rows in this data structure, I need to know if this is a fixable position or not a fixable position. Um, so there are two properties that needs to hold. One, I could have everything in upper. If that's the case, then, um, then I'm already fixed. Because I, I actually have the right amount of things in upper. Uh, otherwise, I need to look at lower and make sure I have enough diodes to spare. I'm pretty sure, though, I could just use this sum lower diode because if this was size zero, it's always going to be less than or equal to the number of spare rows. Um, so I could just do this check because I always have at least zero spare diodes. So, yeah, you could probably get rid of this piece. Yeah, let's do it. Live a little bit dangerously here. OK, back to our algorithm. So now we have this data structure that can basically balance our rows. So I'll call it balancer, and then I'll call it DS for data structure. Um, so I don't like typing a lot of things if I can avoid it. So I use these shorthand. Uh, it's probably not the best thing to do. Uh, 
I can't think of a good name DS for data structure. Okay. So now I'm going to do this two pointer technique. So I'm brute forcing what the first row is. And then I need to walk over the second row until it ends up failing. So I'll write a while loop for that. I'll just basically loop through until either it goes off the board or my data structure is no longer stable. So while it's still stable, what I'll do is take some strip from the, the row information. So if I look here, I need to take some consecutive row and add it to my data structure in order to do the two-pointer sweep for, for that row. So I'll do that here. So I'll call it strip. I get some consecutive strip, add it to my data structure. And then move the second pointer. It's looking pretty good. OK, so what's the height of the rectangle that worked? So basically, when you come out of this piece, one of two things are going to happen. Either it got to the end and everything was stable, or it wasn't. Um, so either it quit the loop because everything was stable. Uh, otherwise, it quit the loop because everything going to end correctly. So I'll, I'll say the height of my uh, rectangle is k1 minus k2 minus 1 because I don't want to include stopping middle here and counting the last diode I added because it caused me to be unstable. But there could be a case where it is stable. So that's the case where k2 equals n. I could do, write it this way, or I could write it as a data structure check. And I'll move that way. OK, so now I need to compute the size of my rectangle. So it's h1 times the, the width of the rectangle. So if you remember, these are column information. So I just get that width information. I'll save that size. And that, that's the best one I've found so far. Now I've gotten to the end of that two-pointer piece. I'm moving on from K1. So I need to remove K1 from our data structure. What I'll do is I'll take a strip here. So this is just a column strip that I'm taking away from K1. Remove one from the other. And then remove it from the data structure. And then the last case is I might not have enough to wipe or to fix the single row that I was at. So if that's the case, then k2 never even progressed. I didn't even have enough to do 0. Um, so I might have to move k2 plus plus. Although I'm pretty sure I always get at least one loop here because the empty set should be stable. So let, let's try taking that out too. Um, maybe that was me being a little too defensive with my coding. Sometimes that's an issue when you're doing two pointers, though. So then I'll just print my result. So that looks pretty good. So you'll notice this algorithm isn't very long. Most of the work is building this balancer that balances the data structure um, as I'm moving through the data structure. And it's a good idea when these things get complicated, just like encapsulate it into a class or encapsulate it into some functions, um, because you, you're going to be reusing things like the stability check maybe even the add or remove, you might, you might be removing things. And it just gets a lot easier to test, too. If you're trying to get something working in contest, you can 
uh, comment things out. So see if it compiles first time. No. Let's see what's up here. Ooh, yikes. That does not look good. Okay, that looks better. Oh, it's comparable, yeah. And so I believe these are the correct samples. So we are at least passing samples for the billboard. So let's see if we can get this one correct too. Hmm, seems to be hanging. Uh oh. Our judge may not be working. Well, it still seems to be that we can. Uh... Oh, right. Yeah, I guess that judge went down. We were resetting stuff for our uh, programming team. So we're, we don't have an easy way to test that tonight, unfortunately. But it did work on samples, so I'm going to assume that the code doesn't have some kind of bug that we need to find. Um, so yeah, that's how you, that's how you code picture pouring um, for this algorithm right here. So what we could the the idea with picture pouring is you just try to figure out two data structures that work well together, and then if you're if it doesn't take too much to move from one state to the next state in terms of rebalancing these data structures as new data is coming in. So it's usually you're looping over a sequence or you're doing something where you're only adding one thing to the data structure, only removing one thing. Sometimes you don't have to do some kind of interval check. Instead, you could have a bunch of different data structures and then maintain some extra summing information like this sum here this spare or some extra information here, and then maintain it on the fly by um, moving back and forth. Actually, I think this add has a bug. Yeah. Oh, let's let's move back. Looking through the code. Yeah. If I. Uh, I forgot to consider moving things back to the other picture. So it just passed samples, but it actually had a bug. Be a little more careful next time. Yeah, this is the case where I have to move things back. Um, so I might move something from upper to lower, but if it wasn't maintaining this invariant, I have to replace it coming back. Um, so I basically move it from left to right as well. So lower to higher. Let's see, did I miss anything else? No. So that, that's, the, that's the data structure. Let's see if it still passes samples. It's amazing that bugs still pass samples, yeah. That, that, that's the basic idea. We don't have to do something really complicated here. We don't have to have some extra crazy data structure. We can just maintain two data structures that do what we want. Um, so I've seen I've seen this used in a lot of cases where you even need to do like an interval tree. It looks like an interval tree problem. And you can completely subvert the interval tree because your data is not changing by much between cases. Um, so amortize, or it doesn't even have to amortize. In between each case, you just make a few moves and you can maintain information for an interval. So I've seen pitcher pouring where you have three pitchers. I've seen it where you have two pitchers, you're just balancing it and saving some information in the middle. 
Um, so it's a pretty useful algorithm in that way. Uh, also, before I sign off tonight, I, I was really happy to see some viewers uh, participating last week in the practice, the North American practice. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're not going to be competing again this week, but we will be competing um, the next public practice. NEIPC will be in, I think, April. Um, so that's the next open practice we're, we're going to compete in. Um, and that should be a lot of fun. So I recommend anyone try that out. There's going to be an open division. You can go to the NEIPC website and find out more. Um, and it's basically a world finals level set or approaching world finals level is what they're trying to shoot for. And uh, yeah, the, the problems are good. So if you're preparing for world finals, uh, it's a great way to to prep and see if you can solve hard problems. Um, talk a little bit about next week before signing off too. Uh, next week, I'm going to extend this idea of solution bags and move into the technique called convex hole optimization. So we're gonna be looking at data structure and variance again. It comes back to this idea of a solution bag. What do you need? What do you need to maintain? And then you just derive what data structure is going to get you that efficiently. And then you go implement that data structure. Um, so that, that's what, how we're going to attack these kind of problems. So uh, I'll be solving two problems next week, hopefully be live coding them. All right. So I'll see you guys all next week. So signing off from Algorithms Live.